Today, I'm gonna to talk to y'all about kind of our plant promotions program here at the Arboretum. It's been a kind of a interesting timing because I've just been contacted by somebody who's making the second edition of a book called Curatorial Practices at Botanic Gardens. And the first edition talked about the J.C. Ralston Arboretum's plant promotions program. And he's been asking me about you know, some of the updates. I said, well, why don't you, <laughs> I'm going to be doing this live in 45 minutes, so you could join then or see it on, on YouTube. But the Arboretum has done a lot of plant introductions and plant promotions, and sometimes those two get conflated a little bit. I'm going to go ahead and start sharing my screen, mostly because my slideshow looks really good this time because most of it was done by, uh, other staff members, so it looks really nice. So to start, let me let me just kind of clarify where we're going with this, and I'll talk a little bit about both, but but mostly about our current program. So there are plant introductions, and those are plants that we introduce, new plants that we introduce. So that may be something that's in our collections that is really nice that we put a name on and put out. It may be something that we are actively breeding that we release. It may be a, a sport that arises on a plant here or a seedling that we grow that is different. So that's introducing new plants. Sometimes we are introducing plants to horticulture, to commercial horticulture, where it's something that may be, you know, kind of grown in a few gardens here and there, but it's really unknown. And so we help popularize it. We don't really consider that one of our introductions when we do that or a new species, that kind of thing. We don't, we don't necessarily look at that as a new introduction. And then there are times when we just promote plants. They're great plants. Nobody's really growing them. And we really try and get behind those and make them popular. And so we do a lot of both of those things. You know, that's kind of always been how the J.C. Ralston Arboretum has helped the nursery industry, help them to grow. So we currently have a program called Choice Plants. And that's, I'm going to talk about that, but let me get into a couple of these other ways we introduce plants. Some of that is through a breeding. And one of the most famous ones that we're known for is the Hartledge Wine Ralston Allspice, Calicanthus Ralstonii Hartledge Wine. And this is a hybrid between our native Calicanthus floridus, the Carolina Allspice, and the Chinese Calicanthus chinensis, which is a, a very, very rare Asian relative, only found in a small area in eastern China. And the name honors both J.C. Ralston with Calicanthus X. Ralstonii and Richard Hartledge, who was a student here. And Richard made the cross. They were both flowering out here. And he made that cross and got three seedlings, one of which survived and grew into Hartledge wine, which is an incredibly popular plant. Let me see if I can pause the share there. All right. I've got, Chris went out and got me some cuttings today. So I've got some some plants here. So I'm going to, some of this I might intersperse with actual plants. Peek behind the curtains here. So you can see this is the Ralston allspice, Calicanthus ralstonii, Hartledge wine, and it just flowers like crazy. And it's amazing. This plant has been around for 20 years. 20 years now, and is still incredibly, incredibly popular. 30 years? Is that right? 1991. Wow, I did not. Yeah, that's even, that's right. 30 years ago. I still remember the first time I saw this plant. I was working in Atlanta Botanic Garden, and JC had sent a rooted specimen down. And yeah, this, that's right. This would be 1995 and 1995-96, and boy, we were so excited to get it. But even today, so just a couple of years ago, we were at the Chelsea Flower Show, where the newest of the new is being put out, and you know everybody's oohing and on over these. 
the big main garden around the central area, they had pride of place. They had Hartledge wine growing there. I went up and looked at it, assuming it was it was some new cultivar that had replicated that cross and maybe was something different in there. But but when I went up there, it was Hartledge wine. And wherever I go to gardens all around the world, Hartledge wine is widely grown. So this is, you know, and certainly an introduction. And it's, you know, a beautiful, beautiful plant. Another one that we're well known for in introduction is Styrax japonicus, Emerald Pagoda, which was Japanese snowbell that Dr. Ralston collected in Korea on Sahuksan Island, Sahuksan Do. That's got this wonderful fluted bark, great big flowers, nice upright habit. Again, introduction, not part of the choice plants. Some plants are things that we just have growing here at the Arboretum. This predates the Arboretum. This was from 1956, Lagostremia. Farii Fantasy came from the National Arboretum from their collection of Lagostremia Farii in Japan in the, the mid 1950s. And we had several of them, but this one, Fantasy, grows much more upright. Other ones are more widespreading. You can kind of see one to the side here. Fantasy, much more upright. And so JC saw that it was different, saw it had potential for not just different, but potential for being a, a superior plant. Um, so he named it Fantasy and, and we got it out. And it's, it's a great tree for, you know, alleys and near streets because it's much more upright than other forms of Lagostremia farii. And you can see, again, that gorgeous bark, that beautiful form. While Dennis Werner was director, he was doing breeding and on past that. And we released several of the plants through the, the Arboretum, like these dwarf butterfly bushes, really the first dwarf butterfly bushes available. And these are functionally sterile. They will produce a few seeds, but whereas one, a typical butterfly bush and one flower panicle will produce thousands of seeds, blue chip will produce a few seeds for the entire plant. So this was a real breeding breakthrough, these dwarf ones that he did, like blue chip, and still the butterflies love it. And really led to kind of this renaissance in butterfly bush, this breeding breakthrough, which was great. But now there's other ones out there that, you know, probably surpass our releases of Budleys. But, you know, that's, that's the way it is, goes. And that's great because what we want to do is support the nursery industry. We're not competing with them. So we introduce a new plant that is fantastic. And then the nursery industry gets in there and goes on beyond what we ever did. Then he continues to breed, although he is retired, fully retired now, but some of his most recent releases through the Arboretum are Flamethrower Redbud, which I've talked about before on here, which again, just a real breeding breakthrough, this color. And Golden Falls, a weeping Redbud. So these are introductions, and that's different than what I'm going to talk about next, which are some of the promotions. We're doing the choice plants now, but that wasn't the first thing we did. So throughout the years, there have been different attempts at promoting plants in a formal manner. JC and other directors, including myself, spend a lot of time out on the road giving talks about great plants that are out there, whether they're from the Arboretum or they are just other fantastic plants. So there was an attempt to um, label plants as J.C. Ralston uh, Arboretum Selections, Superior Plants for the Southeast. And this was done with the North Carolina Association of Nurserymen. And this was really before my time. And I don't know how successful the program was, but by the time I arrived in 2007, it was not still going. So I don't know really, you know, during its heyday, how successful it was, but an attempt was made. Uh, so some of the folks who had been involved with, with this, the North Carolina Association of Nurserymen, now the North Carolina Nursery and Landscape Association, especially the folks here locally, the Johnston County Nursery Association, which are a group of really very good nurseries here close by the Arboretum. 
they got with us and, and said they'd like to try to start a new program. What did we think? Could we come up with some plants that you know we might think about with this? And the way we worked it was we were the arboretum was going to pick a whole list of plants. We bring in members of the Johnson County Nursery Association, both well all everything from retail growers, the liner producers, uh, propagators and the wholesale growers. So kind of the whole thing, now they wouldn't coordinate on pricing or anything like that, but they would look at plants that they thought they would be interested in. So I put together a list and uh, this is the earliest list I can find. And we had a whole, whole bunch of plants, it actually goes on beyond this, there's more than one page. And we voted, I gave, gave kind of a little demonstration on all the plants and we voted on some of our top plants in this and the deal was we would we would do do these we get some of the propagators and, and liner producers to and, and the arboretum would propagate these we'd get them to the growers let them grow them out not a ton but enough to evaluate and then we would uh, you know kind of get back together and talk about them and that way growers could say all right i want a hundred or I want 500 and the propagators could, you know, go into this with a new plant knowing they would already have a market. So it was a way just to make sure everybody was, was covered and what nobody was going out on a limb with some of these new plants. Cause it's hard for a wholesale nursery to, to do that. You know, there weren't always successes. One early one that we were all very, very excited about. It was this holly, Ilex bergerai. We had a male form only here at the Arboretum. So we went out and we found a female form and it grows as this very upright, narrow columnar plant. Now, as it gets older, it will get wider, but as a young to middle-aged plant, it grows very upright. New growth is reddish. The female forms have really nice red fruit. Great plant. People are always asking for hedging plants. They're always asking for narrow plants. Does Properties are getting smaller and smaller. So we looked at this as something that we could, the growers were super excited, felt like they could really sell this plant. Well, this is one of my first experiences with the realities of promoting plants, getting plants into the market. I can show you this picture. You say, this is a beautiful plant. This is great. How come nobody's growing it? Well, what we found was when you propagate it, you can propagate it fine. No problem. It grows just fine in a nursery. Great, all great, except it doesn't form a full dense plant. What you get is one stalk that grows straight up, you know, in a, in a container that doesn't look any good. And to get a really nice full, say three gallon, five gallon, seven gallon container, like the landscapers want, you would have to grow this for at least twice, maybe three times as long as you would some other holly or some other evergreen with similar shape. And so economically, the growers couldn't do it. So it's a great plant, but you're, you're not likely to see it produced commercially anytime. It'll be, it, you know, sometimes some small specialty nurseries will grow it. But that's because that little stick looks fine when it's in a four inch square pot or a pint or a quart, but in a gallon or a three gallon, doesn't look like much. So, you know, there were, there were learning curves. Now we've, I've learned that before I get too excited about getting one of these plants out, got to get it into the nurseries and see how, how, it, how it does. One that we had been watching for a long time here at the Arboretum was this uh, Chinese red bud. It had been in the collection for a long, long time. I can't remember. I haven't gone back and looked at uh, recently when, it, when we first put it in the collection, but we finally decided this was just so good. It was the most floriferous red bud we have ever seen. And we grow a lot of red buds. And this thing just, just covers itself in flowers. So we put the name on it. It was shortly after Kay Yao passed away. So a volunteer suggested Kay's Early Hope since it flowers around March Madness and, you know, the color brings to mind the, the breast cancer awareness. And then you had the heart-shaped leaves on there. And uh, nurserymen were really excited about this one as well. 
And this is this has been a success. This has been one that has really taken off. It can be hard to get because the growers, you know, the, the nurseries are buying as many as can be produced. So we're really excited. And this, this center picture, you know, red buds flower before they leaf out, but they usually finish by the time they're leafing out. These plants will be completely leafed out and they'll still be, they'll still be flowering. So it's also great in cold areas because if some flowers are open and it get a freeze and they, they do freeze, then it'll have more because it just keeps opening them the flowers in waves. Another great plant, this boxwood, this weeping boxwood. This was found down in Texas by the folks at Yucca Do Nursery. So not one of our releases, but one that we were growing and thought was fantastic. And just nobody else seemed to know about it and seemed to grow it. So we put it in this program, you know, the, the nurserymen liked it. They were a little concerned because weeping plants can sometimes be difficult to grow. And what they found is this is fantastic. And it, and it almost gives them two different plants to grow. You can grow it like you see here where it's kind of just, you don't do anything to it. Just let it be a, a weeping mound. Or you can grow it as a plant that's staked upright and kind of make it into a little evergreen tree that's just a fountain of branches going over. What's great about it is it may be the fastest growing boxwood we have here in our collection. It really does grow quite, uh, quite fast. And I always tell people one of the things about boxwoods is they love shade. You can grow them in full sun, but they will grow in dry shade. We were talking, you know, before this got started about it being dry. This is a plant that will tolerate it. So also things that will grow in drier soils, great for containers as well, because if you forget to water them, they won't turn toes up on you immediately. They'll, they give you a little bit of a, of a break there. Another plant that we love, you know, we, we love native plants, and this is our native Calicarpa americana. This, however, is a pink fruited form. Typically they're purple. You also get white but we really like this pink fruited form. The white ones in the fall, as soon as they get a touch of frost, they just kind of turn brown. Whereas these pink ones stay holding color much, much better. They start fruiting when leaves are still on it, but then it'll continue once the, the leaves drop. And the birds do eat them, but they don't eat them immediately. Not like they do our, the native purple ones. So this is Calicarpa America named for the person who found it, Bill Welch, out in Texas. And this is a naturally occurring population. This is not a hybrid between the purple and the white. And when you sow those seedlings, pretty much every single one of them will come up and fruit pink. Now, some will be darker, some lighter. And I do think there is room for an improved, some improved color forms of this, but uh, really an exceptional plant as it is. And this is one of the newer ones in the program. One that I actually didn't put on the list because nurserymen are always going smaller, smaller, smaller. And we had this magnolia that I've, I've talked about a few times from Bobby Green down in Alabama. Uh, Bobby sent us some different things and this one came up. It was unnamed, just had a series of numbers and letters and things after the name, just so he could, he knew what it was, but he used it for breeding. He didn't think it was a la good landscape plant. It was magnolia serendipity. And we grew it, we planted it, and it was a little thing, a little round ball, and just watched it grow. We weren't sure what it would do. And it kept getting bigger and bigger and perfectly round, and it never got damaged in the cold. It never seemed to get damaged. And most of the magnolias kind of grow pyramidal, and this one just kept going rounder and rounder and rounder. And it's big, it's, it's not a, a little plant but it was just so good, so floriferous, and the flowers really sweetly fragrant uh, that we, I, for a long time, I kept saying, you need to put a name on this. Like I'd email Bobby and tell him when I see him, you know, like, you need to put a name on this plant. And he always said, no, 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 it's, it's not that good a plant. And finally, when it was going in this program and people were producing it, I said, Bobby, you've got to put a name on it or else we're going to. So, that was the big plant. This is it as a, a small plant. You can see even in a 
This is a one gallon container. Even in a one gallon container, it's it's got flower buds on it because it's so floriferous. It's already had a few that are spent that I can see. I'll talk about the tags in a minute. There's another one that Chris did some cutting on, and I don't know how well y'all can all see this, but this is this is a, a spent flower back here. These are new flowers. So this is 24 inches long or so. It has, it flowered at every leaf, everywhere you see a leaf, there were most of these two flowers, sometimes three, everywhere where there's a leaf, there were flowers there all the way out to the tip. And there's one that's still not even open yet, a flower bud. There, I put my, can't do my left and right here. I don't know how to show that. There, I'll do it on my face. There's still a flower bud there that hasn't opened up and a few more in here that haven't opened up. So this thing starts flowering kind of in mid-winter, February or so for us, although it was a little bit later this year. This year it didn't start until pretty well into March, but it flowers and flowers and flowers. And if you get a hard a freeze during that time, any of the buds that are still tight, like you see here, it's still covered, completely covered with that, that rusty velvet covering, they'll eat just fine. It doesn't bother them at all. What'll happen is the, the flowers that are completely open will get burnt, they'll turn brown, they'll fall off, but these other buds will keep opening. So, you know, you had two feet of that. So if early on you get, a, it warms up enough for it to start flowering, it always starts at the back. And so the colder it is, those are the least showy flowers anyway. And as you get on into spring and past uh, danger of frost, those are the last flowers. And this plant is so showy when it's in flower, but it's a gorgeous evergreen as well. I just, uh, I, I think this is, just one of the most spectacular plants. And while it isn't an Arboretum introduction, it certainly took the Arboretum, the, the J.C. Ralston Arboretum, to get this plant to be introduced. Because if we hadn't twisted Bobby Green's arm, he would have never put a name on it and never nothing would have ever come from it. Now, one of the ones that we've just put into this program is Osmanthus heterophilus caorihemi which Kaorihimi means fragrant princess. And so this is a, a little leaf Osmanthus. Osmanthus heterophilus growers love because it'll grow into warm zone six gardens. When we first got it, we thought, well, this is a cool little plant, but it's, it's really a collector's plant because we looked at it, the leaves were so small, we got it in a little tiny pot. And it wasn't until we did some cuttings and grew them out that we realized it grows very quickly as a young plant and will quickly make a, a decent sized plant. It'll actually get a little bit bigger than we thought it would. We say it'll probably get bigger than the three by three that we thought it was going to. We've grown in a couple areas. It flowers well in shade or sun. New growth comes out lighter and then it gets dark green. Well, I got another one of these plants here with me. And it's got this little kind of somewhat spiny foliage on there but it is just the most adorable thing. And from a cutting, we take a, a fall or winter, winter cutting and root it by the end of next summer, you can easily have a plant that fills out a one gallon. So this is a quick grower for nurserymen, which they love. But just think you can use this as a little clipped hedge like you do Japanese hollies, some, some other evergreen like that. You can use it as a specimen. You can trim it up into, you know, tight little pyramids if you want. You can let it grow naturally in kind of a more upright rounded shape. But where your, your Japanese holly or something like that that are sold by the gajillions just makes a green plant, this has white flowers that are super, super fragrant and will perfume, you know, an entire garden. So it's, I'm like, yes, please, when you compare the two. And it's spiny, but not enough to really be like vicious. It's not as bad as hollies or things like that, even though it kind of looks like it. I think it's just the most adorable plant. And again, this is not our introduction. It came from Japan. It's also being marketed by another group as Party Princess. Now, 
I'm not exactly sure why you would want to call this party princess when its cultivar name translates to fragrant princess. I think fragrant princess is a much better name to sell it under than party princess, but you know, what, who am I to, to know? Mark, can yes. you talk about size and sun and shade for that one? Yeah, so so this this is our original plant and it's probably five feet tall and maybe three feet wide. So it's it's definitely growing bigger than we thought it would. And that's one of the issues. And I'm I'll talk about that a little bit later. But you know, when you're you're making these tags and making sales material, sometimes with newer plants, sometimes it's hard to know how you know, what they're going to do. We really thought this was going to be a very, very small plant. And it's, it's, it's turned out to be a fair bit larger than we think. Now I've seen some plants almost as old as ours that have been grown in really full sun and they are much tighter and denser than ours. So it, it depends a little bit on its conditions. It does grow and stretch a bit more in, in shade. Is that what you were asking, Chris? Yep. And one of our biggest successes is this plant. And this started with the original group of plants that we were doing, well, prior to 2012. The first group were, was released in 2012. This was a plant that during 2007 drought, one of the plants that I noticed was that we did so well was Viburnum obovatum, a native viburnum to the South Georgia, Florida kind of area. A little leaf viburnum, not well known, sometimes called Walter's viburnum. And not, if you, you would pass it in the wild and barely notice it probably. It's one of those kind of scrubby looking plants that you get down in that area. But there's some, some dwarfer ones out there. Ms. Schiller's Delight is one. There's Walter's Claim to Fame, World Class, a couple of different ones, Compactum. And we had one that was very similar to Ms. Schiller's Delight. And actually, that's what we thought it was. And then we went out and, and got what was in the trade as Ms. Schiller's Delight, because that was something that was, that was out there and available. And what we found was Ms. Schiller's Delight grew much more upright than the, our plant, which makes more of a domed plant. And when our, the nursery partners were growing it in the nursery, what they found was when they were growing both side by side, what they found was, was that the Ralston Hardy kept its leaves when uh, Ms. Schiller's Delight would drop its leaves. And so they were really thrilled about it and called it Ralston Hardy. And this plant is, is just amazing. It's super drought tolerant once it's established. You know, talk about looking like a, a little dwarf Japanese holly, that this does, except for it covers itself in flowers. And in usually around April, it is one, it's like a white dome. These flowers, the, the pollinators love it. It'll usually start throwing out some flowers in October or November and keep doing it all winter and then really just cover itself in the, the spring with the flowers. The foliage on a cold winter will turn kind of plum purple. If it gets really cold, it'll drop a lot of its leaves, which keep it from being, from being damaged too bad. And then it'll still flower in the spring and put out new leaves and, and grow. It's, it's really been a wonderful plant. So we were growing this and somebody at UNC came to one of the nurseries and saw it and said, you know, we'll, we'll, we're looking for some new things. We'll, we'll take you know, we'll take 25 of those. And they planted them and came back about a year later and said, we want 5,000 of them because they were going to redo a lot of plantings around campus. And they were just so blown away with this. Grower didn't have 5,000, but gave them about 500. But now these growers that we're partnering with are selling this plant by the, by the hundreds and thousands. It is, it is getting to be uh, one of their really, really popular plants. And if you're here in Raleigh, if you drive in front of, if you drive down Hillsboro, the, the library renovation, the D.H. Hill library renovation, the landscape you can see from, from Hillsboro, they've got these planted out in front. 
So NC State is jumping on board with these too. They really like them because they're, like I said, once they're established, they're very, very drought tolerant. Uh, so makes them great for, for some tough spots that they have on campus. Where it grows, it grows in these sand hillocks and some pocosins where it'll be seasonably flooded. And so they actually are great plants for rain gardens because they'll take inundation, but they'll also take the dry soils they have between rains in a rain garden. So there it is, full thing. I mean, the thing is gorgeous. And the height so, on that one, Mark? What's that? The height on that one? The height on that one, um, that's about four feet. And here's a problem with heights. Plants continue to grow. They don't stop. You know, herbaceous plants only get so big and then they die back to the ground. So how do you tell people how big a plant gets? So take a great landscape plant used as a street tree in, on south of South Glenwood, Glenwood South here in Raleigh. Trident maple, Acer bergeranum. Tough tree, urban tolerant, cold tolerant. They grow this pretty far north. If you look at a plant tag on there, it usually says it's a small maple growing to about 25 feet. So in the northern climates, 25 feet in 10, 15 years is probably right. For us, 25 in 20 years, 10, 20 years in a not tough plot, you know, not planted as a street tree, but in a, in a garden, it's probably going to go to 35 trees, 35 feet. If we leave it in that garden for 50, 60 years, it can grow up to be an 80 foot tall tree. So do you sell it as a 25 foot tree or an 80 foot tree? You know, it's going to take it the better part of uh, a century to get to be 80 feet, but does that make sense? You know, so it's, it's very difficult with these things. So we don't know how big Ralston Hardy will get ultimately in, in 30 years, it might get to be six feet tall, but it hasn't been grown for that long. It had been under evaluation for over a decade though. So we did feel like we were, we were comfortable in talking about it in that sense. Thank you. And you have two more requests. Robert's, Robert would like for you to go back to that last image so we could drool over it a little bit more. Oh, I'm going the wrong direction. Yep. And um, uh, nice? Shirley just asked, what about the sun requirements for this viburnum? Oh, good question. So this grows in full sun to part shade. It's such a good plant. So where I was going next is, you know, it's easy to say, well, we're going to have a, a plant introduction program. We're going to have a promotions program, you know, we picked out some, some of the plants that we really wanted. We figured out if we could grow them in the nursery and how they did. All right, let's go. And then you're like, well, we got to do something with them. We can't, you know, you, you got to have all the materials that go alongside them. So Chris Glenn, mostly with some help from Nancy Dubrava here on staff and, you know, input from, from the entire group had to develop sales materials like posters, point of sale posters for, for the retail nurseries like, like this and this, you know, something that you can put out both, you know, big sizes and small sizes to put at, you know, right there where the plant is. And, you know, we could put locally grown because this is all being um, done early with our local growers. And you can see this is when we thought what we had was Ms. Schiller's Delight. And really what we had was a different plant that was similar. But you also have to have tags that hang on all the plants. So, you know, Kay's early hope. We, we have all this information here and, you know, how to plant it and all these things that, you know, are, have to go into it. And so somebody has to design that. That doesn't just happen. Um, and that's, you know, uh, and the nurseries looked at, looked to us to do that. And so thankfully we have folks like, like Chris at all who can, who can put these things together. And this is how we pay, this is how we pay for the program is we, we get the tags made and then the nurseries purchase the tags from us. So they'll call us up and say, all right, I need, you know, 100 K's early hope red bud tags. I need 
500 Ralston Hardy tags and 100 Welch's Pink Beauty Berries. And so we get them those. We also have to have to promote the the program. So uh, let's see if this will this will work. Y'all seeing my internets? You seeing the website, Chris? No, we just see the uh, uh, PowerPoint presentation with the URLs. All right, let me try this then. So you know, we talked to the folks. You know, the the Cal's College of Ag and Life Sciences here at NC State talked to them about, you know, what we're, what we're doing, you know, to get the word out and, you know, they'll do that kind of uh, promotion. We'll also, you know, something that I didn't think about that I am quite sure was, was Chris is, hey, <laughs> we got to get a, We've got to get a if we our program's called choice plants we got to get the url for that and so we have a url which this just directs people well that just directs people back to the choice plants part of on our website but you know there, there's all those kinds of things is you know you can have this program but if nobody knows about the program then what good does it do you so you know you've got to we, we have to promote it and there have been some some misses shall we say, when Tony Avent laughs at you and says, you're never going to sell it, uh, you know, you might be in trouble. One of the plants in the first group we did is this heteropterus glabra, the red wing. This is an awesome plant. It comes from Paraguay Ur and Uruguay. So it's South American, perfectly hardy for us here. It flowers from about midsummer with these bright yellow flowers and masses of them. And then immediately after the flowers fade, it forms these red, they look like the little maple whirly gigs, the maple samaras, except for instead of two of them, there's three together. It's, it's bizarre to me wh why a plant in this family would form seed structures just like a, a maple, which is completely unrelated. It's kind of a vine plant. I love it. I love it, love it, love it. I think it is so cool. I think it is showy for such a long period. The problem it, with it is it's got no leaves on it in the spring. <laughs> it doesn't really want to leaf out and do anything until, oh, getting well into May, and, you know, and then, you know, it's not really flowering until mid, late June. And people aren't buying plants then. And vines are already a tough sell. And this is one that you kind of have to train to get it to go up anything. So it just never took off. They grew a bunch of these and, and the, I think the nursery folks dumped them cheaply. We've got a lot of tags left that didn't work, but it is gorgeous. I still think it's a, it's a fantastic plant. I grow it. Then we had other issues. You know, I mentioned, I showed you that that other tag that that said or, or sign that said Miss Schiller's delight. So we've got a bunch of tags and everything, and then we had to go back and get new ones. Well, this was another one we were excited about. One of our nursery, one of the nurserymen partners, had found this abelia that had a white edge and a white flower, no pink in it. So it was quite a bit different than what was out there. And we named it Frosty with them, and. We were bulking it up and going to put it out. And right about that time, another North Carolina nurseryman had a plant that was basically identical that he was releasing. And it was a big nursery. And, you know, the nurserymen are, while they're in competition, they are friends. And so they got together with this other nurseryman and they decided, the Johnson County folks we, just, we worked with decided not to introduce this plant because another one by the name of Radiance was going to be introduced. And really early on, you couldn't tell the difference between the two. I've seen some differences since then, and there's been some talk about reviving Frosty, but I don't know if it's different enough to really warrant that. But, you know, so again, we went through a lot of time and effort and expense and, you know, go back to square one. And that's just the way these things, these things work. 
we had the whole thing with Frosty there. But then there's, you know, there's still things that we're looking forward to introducing through the program. One that we have, we've released in various ways in small numbers to folks like our, through our Arboretum sales and auctions has been this Cornus Wilsoniana that we've named White Jade. Beautiful, small little flowers, gorgeous bark. I think we have the best bark one in the U.S. Great plant. And what we've done with this, we were struggling a little bit to get it well propagated. It seems like when we propagate, when it works, it works great. We get 100%. When it doesn't work, it really struggles. But that's, that is one that will probably do, sell through that program here. And we've got somebody who's producing liners in large numbers. That's part of the reason I want to go out to the West Coast this summer is to see how he's doing with those. And so we're, we're really hopeful that, that this will be a big seller. The nurserymen are certainly excited about it. Another one that has the nurserymen excited here is, is this one. This is a oak leaf hydrangea. So one of our Southeastern native hydrangeas called Turkey Heaven where it was collected on a place in Alabama called Turkey Heaven Mountain. And we first noticed it because it has this huge double-headed flowers. Now, is that different enough to introduce? I don't know. There's Harmony out there. There's some other big double-headed oak leaf hydrangeas. We, were, we started looking at it really carefully because it had these big heads and it seemed to hold them upright better than uh, Harmony did and had nice big showy foliage. So we got nurserymen to produce it around here and they were kind of skeptical about it because several of them said they don't grow oak leaf hydrangeas because they look so bad in the fall. They can only sell them in the spring because the foliage under their overhead irrigation gets all kinds of spots on it and just doesn't look good. It looks ratty and, and it, it's healthy. It just doesn't look good in the, in the fall. And so some of them had some growing out in the nursery side by side with other oak leaf hydrangeas under the same treatment. And what they found was that the foliage stayed looking clean in their nurseries. So there is a, we're looking at, at putting this in the program. We, it, we'll, we won't change the cultivar name. You, you, you should only put a cultivar name on one time. And this cultivar is Turkey Heaven. But what we will do probably if we release this through the program is put a sales name on there, not trademark it, not anything like that, but it's just Turkey Heaven Hydrangea is not going to sell. So they were thinking something like Carefree Cloud or, or something along those lines as a sales name. Another Magnolia that we, we really wanted in the program from early on was this banana shrub, Magnolia Figo. It's out in the trade as both Royal Robes and Velvet Queen, but it's one of, it's the darkest flowering Magnolia Figo variety Crassipes that we're aware of. And it also happens to be on one of the best forms of banana shrub we've ever grown. It stays really dense and, and kind of a squat pyramid. It flowers incredibly heavily and it is one of the two hardiest banana shrubs, you know, pure banana shrubs that we've grown, the other being Gail's favorite. But you can see this is after our very cold winter when we got down to at least six degrees Fahrenheit in the Arboretum. And you can see it, it got a little bit of damage, but that's it. And that's the worst it's been, it's been damaged and it still flowered that spring. It's a plant that when I showed it to NC State plant breeder, Tom Ranney, Tom, you know, we were talking about it. And I was telling him how great it was. And, and Tom kind of looked at it for a little while. And, you know, I was talking to him like he should be breeding with this. And he said, finally said, what am I going to do? It's already tight and compact. It's already hardy. It's already got the, you know, super deep colored flowers. How do I improve it? It's like, well, good point. I guess you don't. So, but we could not, we gave hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of cuttings of this 
to other folks. We stuck it a million times, never had any success. But then one of our great North Carolina growers figured it out. And I, I'm not sure where this is in their pipeline yet, but I think maybe they're still building numbers for it, but great plant that's going through this program. And now I'm gonna show you super secret plant. This is one that somebody talked, so we should, we should patent it, protect it, but we, this was from a sport we found in public and so we're not going to. We'll see how this works in production, whether it's quick enough, but this is our native Ilex vomitoria, this bright gold little spot here. We've got it at the Arboretum, I won't tell you where, but this is also, this is in my garden. And uh, what we're finding is it really needs full sun. If it's not in full sun, it doesn't color up well. But the new growth comes out red, real red right as it comes out and then goes bright gold, holds that gold color. So it's this dwarf Ilex vomitoria, dwarf Yopon holly that is bright, bright gold. So we've given some to nurserymen. The, the, the question now is, does it grow fast enough in production to, to make it a worthwhile plant? to introduce that way. If not, we'll still introduce it. It just won't go through this bigger program. And I'm gonna go back to one more that I put in late and apparently in the wrong place, but I do wanna show it and then I'll answer questions. Okay, another one that was one of our introductions and that I never thought I would say might go through this uh, choice plants program. Now, I don't know for sure. We haven't talked to the nurserymen about this, but Fagus grandifolia white lightning, which is this dwarf form of our native American beech, one of the only named varieties out there. It's just an amazing little plant. And during the winter when the leaves drop, oh, it's gorgeous, really nice during the season. In the fall, it kind of goes this russet. It's just, it's a beautiful, beautiful little plant. And it has been almost impossible to propagate. We have sent it to the best grafters we know across the country from the West Coast, East Coast, Pennsylvania, here in North Carolina, Tennessee, just all over. And we had the first person we sent it to had got one and said they never wanted to see the plant again. Another person got two and was wanted to try it again. Our own Leanne Keneally, when she was working with us, got a few to go. And then just the other day, one of our longtime members, supporters, good friends, Plant Nuts, came in with a whole tray of them and said he figured it out. And so there's when you're grafting, there's a very specific technique called hot callusing which you don't do with many plants. You do it a lot of times with grafted horse chestnuts and buckeyes. And I won't, I won't get into the, the, all of how it's done, but he said he did this with hot callusing and had 100% success. And so we figured this out now. So now we know how to produce it. That makes it one step closer to being available publicly. So who knows, this may be something that shows up in the not too distant future in our program. So we were able to get most of the questions as we went. And I, I think it was uh, Wayne had a couple of uh, doozies. I'm going to label them as that, that okay. I thought we better, better take care of at the end. Wayne most recently asked, what type of financial benefit might we expect from these intros? So it varies. We have, at this point, our policy is, and this, this could change as our funding streams change here. We have always felt that if we have not put rigorous scientific thought and work behind the plant, we won't patent it. So if we spend years developing a weeping gold leaf red bud, yeah, we might patent it and go with, you know, a big company like Greenleaf or Proven Winners or Southern Living to, to introduce it, to, you know, really put it out and sell it nationally. If it's something we just find, like that little gold Ilex vomitoria, 
that was found growing in a hedge by the in front of a Wawa near the RDU airport. So we didn't do it. We just went out and took cuttings of it. So we get some financial benefit from, you know, this, the introduction, this promotions program through the tags, you know, it's a, it, it, the, the model is called, is called a, you know, tag funded. So the nurserymen buy the tags from us. And that's really a, an honor system that if, if, you know, the ones who are selling them to nurserymen, like there's one nursery that grows a lot of trees, they sell straight to, excuse me, not nurserymen, they sell straight to landscapers. So they don't, the landscapers don't want the tag on there. So they don't, the nursery doesn't want to buy these tags and put them on there. So instead they just, if they sell 100 of these trees, they give us a donation and the amount of what they would purchase the tags for. So we get some that way, but really we see this as mutually beneficial. It's a special program for these nurseries that support us. They get access to some of these great plants uh, that they can sell like Kay's Early Hope and, and Ralston Hardy Viburnum. And we get some, we get some recognition in the community and beyond. We get some money. So there's that. Now the white jade Cornus wilsoniana I mentioned, we sent a bunch of material to the West Coast to a liner producer. They're going to do a voluntary royalty for us. So for every plant they sell, we will get, I, I think it's, I think a dollar. So if they would have normally sold their liner for, you know, three fifty, they'll sell it for four fifty and and send us a dollar. Again, that's that's a gentleman's handshake kind of a, agreement. Now, if we put that in the program, and all the nurserymen here buy that plant, they'll pay four fifty for it. The liner producer will give us a dollar. The growers here will grow the plant out get the tag from us, purchase it that way. And so there are, there is some of that. As we do more plant breeding, like the red buds, the butterfly bush, other things, as we move more in that direction, and we are, you know, that's more, we're more likely to, to, when we, when we're ready to release something that's really amazing, more likely to partner with a national partner because you know, if you're selling it through a, a big nurse national producer, it's just the sales are there. And so it makes sense, you know, they would go through all the hassle of, of working with us, of protecting it, and then they would get it. But we would, anything we did like that, we would work out special deals so that our North Carolina Nursery Association folks would have more access than they would otherwise. Okay. And I missed Robert's question earlier, so I apologize for Robert, but Robert asked, are the choice plants trailed throughout the Southeast? Are they trialed throughout the Southeast? Yes and no, not in a, not in formal trials. So there are, we don't have a bunch of trial spots that we send them to but we do share them with other nurseries and things like that. And so we check in with people on where these plants are and how they're doing. And uh, Wayne's other question was, is how much competition does our program have across the US or Southeast? There are a lot of these types of programs and I don't necessarily think I look at them as competition. You know, we're not going to compete with a, a, say, a Southern Living. You know, their program is is much much larger. I think more likely that what's happened is, you know, Southern Living looks at some of the stuff we're doing and says, "Wow, those are some good plants. We'd like to put them into into production." And we've already got growers who are growing it, so the Southern Living folks can contract straight with the growers who are already growing it, and it becomes a win 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 for everybody. So let's see, there's a question about Mexican cornus on our website. Where can you buy it? For those who don't know, Mexican corn, uh, cornus is, is a form, a subspecies of our native Mexican, uh, 
Cornus floridana, uh, flowering dogwood, except for those, those white bracts are fused at the top. So it's like a little um, you know, Chinese lantern kind of thing. It's very cool. Flowering right now, Arboretum, really neat little thing. Um, where can you buy it? Good luck with that. I don't know. Look for Cornus florida subspecies urbiniana, or sometimes Cornus pringlei. Uh, sometimes we do propagate it and have a few for sale or auction. Uh, I don't think we have anything going right now. And Girish has asked about his eastern flowering red bud. It said it's three years old and has no flowers yet. When can you expect it to flower? Well, um, Girish, that's, that's a tough question. If it's, if, if it's a named cultivar like Merlot or Flamethrower or the Rising Sun or, you know, any of those, it should flower soon because that should, that would be a grafted plant. And so it's, it's got mature wood and I would expect it to have already be blooming if it's happy. If it's a three-year-old seedling that's been grown from wild collected material, it may take it a long, it may take it another two or three years to flower, possibly even more. If it's in dense, dense shade, it won't flower very well. Um, Chris, can you think of anything else that might keep it from flowering? I, I was thinking the main thing, if it's just a, a plain seeding guy from the nursery, it might just take an extra year or two. In, in good ideal conditions, I think they can flower as early as year two or even three, but that's a full sun area. I'm, I'm guessing it's just too much shade for his red bud because they, they typically flower early, no matter yeah. how you get them. If it's a seedling, if it's a seedling grown plant, it's hard to tell, you know, sometimes... Yeah. People ask that about their dogwoods, why they don't flower heavily, why they're not flowering. And it winds up, it's just a, you know, a seedling mm -hmm. uh, dogwood. And, you know, the ones that are named were selected usually for their flowering. And, you know, they, they do tend to. Yep. Yeah. And Mary has just asked about Calicanthus Venus. She's wondering what happened to that one. So it, nothing happened to Calicanthus Venus. It's still available in the trade. It's still out there. It's a great plant. Uh, Calicanthus Venus was uh, Tom Ranney's um, work to, he didn't just repeat the, the cross that, that created Aphrodite, he brought in other genetics as well. So you get kind of the look of Calicanthus Hartledge wine, but you also get the fragrance from Calicanthus, which is missing from Hartledge wine. So Garish has confirmed that it was a seedling grown plant. Yeah, that's, so that's just, it, 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 I mean, it may wind up being wonderful. It just might take it longer to get there. Yeah. Um, and there's a lot of things planted around it. Like even, even in a lawn, it's going to have more competition and be slower growing. Yeah. And somebody made the comment that their, their rising sun bloomed the first year. See, the difference is a seedling is growing from seed. Your, your rising sun, that's, that was a seed with the seedling was planted in a field and it grew for a year and then it was grafted and that seedling top was taken off and it was grafted in late summer early fall so it sat there over winter the next year that graft from a mature tree grew and then it was harvested the next year potted up possibly grown on for another year and so what you're starting with is that that graft is coming off of a, a mature plant so so those will flower generally the first year you bring them home if not the, if, if not then the second year and, and whereas a seedling is growing from true juvenile stage to maturity I do have that's, a, that's, a, that's a difficult topic and in our propagation workshops i like to point out of the uh, oak trees for instance in the fall that have the leaves on them at the base that's the juvenile phase of the oak tree. And then higher up, they're leafless. That's the adult phase of the tree. So that's a neat way of seeing what the effect is. Yeah. So I have a direct message is this, how does this pro project compare or relate to flora of Virginia? It, it doesn't at all really. Flora of Virginia project is you know, cataloging the, the, the plants growing wild in Virginia, whereas we're really talking about cultivated plant material. If I didn't answer that, you ask, feel free to ask it again. And I believe that was the questions, Mark. 
All right. Thanks for a great presentation. Well, thank y'all. And look for those labels that I showed on the screen. Those, you can see those at our at local nurseries around here and beyond. There, we've even sent those labels to Virginia and South Carolina growers. We didn't have to. They wanted those, those labels on there because they felt like the JCRA name would help them sell the plants. And I, I put it in the chat. If your local nursery doesn't have some of the choice plants, just have them look for them. They're available down in Johnson County from the wholesalers, so they have easy access to them. Yeah, they can go. There's a site for like your retail nursery to go to. It's not for it's not for folks to go to to buy retail, but for retail folks to buy from wholesale. So, but Joco Plants, they have just J O C O for Johnson County. Joko Plants, they have a site that can that nurseries and landscapers can search and find those plants. So they're not hard to find. No. Well, in the area. Yeah. Sally, you may have some trouble out in Little Rock, Oregon. <laughs> Sally can come for a visit. <laughs> but thanks a bunch, Mark. And thank you everyone else for coming and joining, and joining us online today. Yeah, thank y'all for joining us with Deeper in the Garden midweek.